the next part, the next module in the EG basics lecture talks about com complex EG phenomena. So these are phenomena that consist of multiple parts co-occurring and so on. Here is a pretty interesting little plot. Um, from EEG of a person, it's a, it's a single 10 second slice. Um, the raw EEG looks somewhat like this on multiple channels, you know, a couple of occipital channels, a few central channels, and so on. It's very much the same signal, okay? Uh, so you see a spike here, it's in many channels, etc. The oscillations show up in multiple channels, although they are slightly weighted differently. And actually, there was a task, you know, they got a penalty, then they got something wrong, wrong, correct. They got a bonus for being correct. They got a couple more correct and things like that. So there's a lot of interesting structure in this experiment. And here is the signal separated into independent components or statistically independent components, which basically sum up to generate the signal. Um, and the way in which this basically works here is you have a signal. And by the way, these signals all look different. You know, um, So you have one which is. Um, kind of spiking uh, at whatever s couple seconds or so rhythm. And this signal primarily is present in these frontal channels. And it turns out it's an eye effect. It's actually blinks um, that happen here. And here's a related one, has almost the same time course, slightly different, uh, has a similar projection, also slightly different. It's another eye component. In fact, it might be the other eye. Perhaps for this person, the two eyes weren't exactly in sync, and that's why. Um, although the maps would be a di bit different, so it's probably just two different related blink processes. <coughs> then we see oscillations in different frequencies. So the most prominent here is this alpha one. Uh, this, you know, you will learn what alpha looks like uh, in raw EG just looking at the time scale and the burstiness of the signal in a sense. It comes from posterior cortex. It's a tangential, so uh, that's an interesting signal. It's also locked to the events. You see this? It happens basically right between the events. Perhaps when the person just uh, sort of knows, okay, there's not going to be anything happening for the next half second. I zone out in a sense subconsciously. Here's another one. It um, uh, it's a theta oscillation, a lower frequency. It ramps up during this correct phase and so on. So there's a tremendous amount of structure. And other things like the ECG, you know, the heartbeat signal is also in there, has an interesting projection pattern, you know, looks somewhat weird, very deep. If you fit a dipole, it's extremely deep. It's probably in the brainstem or something like that, uh, even though it, it's not really generated by a brain dipole, generated by your arteries and so on. And here's EMG, this muscle, muscle activity. It, <laughs> you see where this comes from? It's, um, it's a temporal, um, or basically at the side source. It's a very, very focal projection, very small scale. And it's because the muscle is right under the skin. Uh, that's why it's so sharp. And there are lots and lots of positions where these can occur, basically all around from the ears all the way back. There's even muscles up here, as you know. And here you see a really clean textbook um, time series of spiking of muscles. Uh, that's usually muscle activity is broadband. You know, it goes all over the spectrum. But here it looks really clean. By the way, this comes from a statistics, and it comes from the book Elements of Statistical Learning or so, um, which is a really nice open source textbook on machine learning in statistics. OK, so um, here's a, a picture of um, activity that happens between multiple signal components. Um, it's, it's a higher order phenomenon in, in a sense. Uh, you have two components, you know, the red one and the blue one, and sometimes their peaks are in sync, they are coherent, and at other times they are, say, exactly out of phase, and at other times there's something happening in one time series and nothing in the other. And so there's moments when they have high power at the same time, so that's already interesting, and then there's cases where they're phase locked and other cases where they're out of phase. Like here it's probably 90 degrees and so on. And that's phenomena. You can observe it, and you can assign interpretations to it. You can see if, you, if that contains information or not, like the phase relationship between two time series. Um, and it can be very interesting. But to get there, you already need to have, say, the source time courses, because in the channels, you don't see much like that. By the way, this comes from a simulation, but um, there's 
stuff like that also happening in real uh, data. And you can, can go actually a lot farther beyond mere coherence between sources. You can even look at <coughs> basically directed, uh, we call it information flow or connectivity. This is um, pictures from Tim Mullen's uh, toolbox SIFT. Uh, which is also being developed at the Swartz Center. You see um, things like, um, you know, say one source here, kind of driving a bunch of other sources um, in in some statistical sense. It's a complicated matter. There will be lectures on that um, later on. Um, I, I won't dive into too much details here, but it's an interesting, very very complex and structured phenomenon. I also have a little video on that. Show you that. Um, so we. Switch display resolutions real quick. So what you see here is again the same person, um, wireless headset. And um, from the source activity that you saw in the first video, we average activity in certain regions of interest and uh, basically time series for these regions. So it is just a time course. And uh, we look at multiple of these time series. And then we calculate. Um, statistical influences between these time series. It's basically about whether one source predicts the future his, um, uh, time course of another source. And if so, we draw an arrow in that direction. And so you see you can do this completely in real time for quite a lot of sources, for quite a lot of edges between sources, basically directed information flow and so on. Um, you can visualize it. The slowest part here is the visualization, I'm being told. <laughs> Um, so, and you can run a BCI on top of these features if you want to. And in fact, we've done that for error processes. Worked pretty well. Um, so, so that's an example of things that you can do with complex brain phenomena.